stories of Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw. That would be your Chickasaw native, your Chickasaw Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And we got the pod father. The man has revolutionized <laughs> sports entertainment podcasts, sports podcasts. You go through his life. He's one of those guys that hadn't been successful, has been incredibly successful at everything he's done. To us, he's just billionaire Connie who owns oh. the entire state of <laughs> Alabama. He is Conrad Thompson. Conrad, welcome to the show. You guys are reaching to the bottom of the barrel for gifts. <laughs> God, yeah. Heck no, we're saving it. You are the main event, the main event Thank of goodness. everything. The Listen. cream, the cream rises to the top, and we 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 got, we got the very best. And the reason that you're so good, uh, uh, billionaire Connie, is you got you got to work with that damn Jim Ross and Bruce Prichard every week. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But man, we had John and I talk about and laugh about you all the time. The, the 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 problems that you probably got with those egos controlling those egos. But anyway, let's go back a little bit to billionaire Connie. Before you was that billionaire Connie, and you you was one of those guys. I, I I you know the great thing about doing this show, no matter how well you know somebody, John and I always do deep 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 research on us. I I heard about how how your fascination, how your first wrestling event you went to. You weren't a wrestling fan in the beginning, but you went you went you went over with a, a TV rep to a to a, sh a house show you thinking it was probably WWE and it turned out to be Impact Wrestling or something like that <laughs> and you and you went to meet the girls the chicks not and and, and pretty soon here comes two of two swing guys out and you have to meet them and you and, and back, back up in the bar tell us a little bit about how how billionaire Connie got excited about wrestling. Well, it, I was actually a wrestling fan for the first time when I discovered it, uh, may, way back when you had to go to like blockbuster and rent a VHS that feels like a hundred years ago now, but my parents decided when we went to visit my grandfather and I guess it was late, late summer 88, Hey, let's go get him a babysitter. And back then what you would do is you'd slide a tape in and then the parents go hang out and do whatever. Well, the one I picked was the double tape WrestleMania four. So I watched WrestleMania four and just fell in love with, oh my God, these are like, this is He-Man and GI Joe, but the live action version, this is the coolest thing ever. And I was a super fan for a bit. My first show was actually a WCW television taping in Montgomery. I grew up in Prattville, Alabama, and it was back during the marathon TV taping days. Oh, wow. So in between TV tapings, we left and thought the show was over because we'd been there like three hours, but they still had hours to go when we left. My first WWF show would have been here in Huntsville, right down the street from my house here at the Von Braun center. It was savage and dusty on top. Uh, and I was a super fan through maybe 92 and then sort of grew out of it and then was changing the channels in 96 and saw Hogan with a black beard and thought, what is this? And got way back in kind of wandered off a little bit again in early 06. And then in 13, I was way too deep, but in between there. I started advertising my mortgage company a lot on radio and TV. And so one of our favorite TV reps just happened to stop by our, our favorite watering hole. And he said, Hey, do y'all want to walk over to wrestling here? And I'm like, nah, we're good. And my buddies were like, the girls will be there. Let's go there. And I'm like, Hey, and the guy goes, I can get you to meet the wrestlers. Let's go. And I'm like, guys, this isn't what you think it is. This is, this is for little kids. This isn't for us. Like, what do you think you're going to do to propose to Angelina love in the, what, what are you doing? And so they're like, let's just go a few whiskeys in, let's just go. So we walk over, they're all excited. Who are we going to meet? You know, is Brooke Hogan here or who's here? Is it, is it velvet sky? What, what who are we going to meet abyss and AJ styles? And uh, <laughs> then we walk back to the bar and by the way, they were great, but they're probably thinking they're coming to meet make a wish kids or something. And it's me and two of my double stuff buddies, like, hello. I mean, so it was a little goofy, but it is what it is. With, with a few shots in them too, right? <laughs> with a few shots in them thinking, here's our shot. And I'm like, what are you, what's the upside? What's the angle here? But yeah, I got, I got my friends backstage to meet AJ Styles and Abyss. I don't know why they'd be AJ Styles and Abyss be disappointed. You got a couple of guys who aren't really fans that are drunk backstage. Yeah, that's <laughs> fine, right? How you doing? And who are you? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, did you read this? I don't, I, I'm sorry. I digress, but do you read the story when Hornswoggle uh, met the rock and the rock thought he was a make a wish kid? Yes. What a great all time story. It's that the, Hornswoggle is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> he, he really is. I love Hornswoggle. How could you not? 
<laughs> yeah, we, we had him we had him on Conrad. He was so funny. He told some of the ribs, you know, the, the, the little guy, he had so many ribs pulled on him because of his size, but you know, no, because size, he's mean. Because he's mean, but don't uh, yeah, don't be deceived by his size because he is a mean little less SOB boy. <laughs> he he wanted to fight me several times and uh, leaving the bar for some reason. I can't understand why. <laughs> That's amazing. I would love to see you guys in a wrestling match. We're going to make that happen. <laughs> who, who, who's you guys, John? You and, and you and Swoggle. Uh, that's Mr. right. Risco, come on, make him tap. Risco, you, you talking about your last match? Oh, <laughs> that's it. That's that's why we're here today, Mr. <laughs> Risco. I just purchased today with the with the the keen eye of Mr. John Layfield. He purchased the domain. Went to GoDaddy.com. Briscoe's Last Match.com. It's happening in Iowa in July. You don't want to miss it. Tickets are on sale now. Yep. Bingo. Speaking of July, man, what, what, <laughs> what a night, what a night that's going to be. I'm not even going, I'm not even going to add credibility to that statement there because, uh, I think I, 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 I passed the age. I, I know, I know the guy that had his last match that Conrad uh, made a fortune off of and didn't <laughs> share <it. laughs> But uh, I'm not going to get involved in that. I, I'm too old. I, I recognize I'm too old. I have no no illusion to grandeur anymore. I went out doing a job, and that's how I want to go out. Wait a minute, Jerry. <laughs> Last time you and I were out down in St. Louis, you challenged me about 2 o'clock in the morning. So don't tell me that you're out of the business. Let's do it. Well, that's two o'clock in the morning, you know, evil, evil demons were possessing me at that time there. And, and, and you kept egging me on, you kept punching me in the face or something like that. And I finally, no. all right, John, there's a ring right there. Let's get in. And you refused to get in the ring with me. Well, yeah, I respect for you, Mr. Briscoe, you hired well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and, and the fact you've stretched me about 2000 times. Thank you. But anyway, Conrad, Waterloo, Iowa coming up. What a weekend we got in store for you. You're you're our, our guest of honor there. You're getting the the, the Gordon Soli Award and the past winners up with Gordon Soli himself and Jim Ross and now Conrad Thompson. Imagine Conrad Thompson with those three names. Did you I ever can't. think that growing up in Alabama? Wow. No. And when you called and told me, I thought you were asking me to attend to support someone else. Like, what the hell am I doing in the Hall of Fame? I don't think I belong, but uh when you're invited, there's only one answer. And as Misco, Mr. Briscoe said, it's yes. So yes. And thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you. But this is, this is an honor that, 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 you know, we, 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 we installed about three years ago and we have the Jim Melby award, which, you know, for people that the right about wrestling, it. but you know, it's modern times now. There's so many different ways of getting your wrestling news now. And, you know, the, the, the podcast, the old dirt sheets are, are gone now, now it's podcasting and man, you're the creator of that. So we, we added this award so we could include the podcast, the electronic part of it. You know, not, not the, not just the writers. We still have the Melby award, but we added the Gordon Soli award so we could add guys like you. And, and after we, you know, we'd, we'd been kicking ourselves in the, in the butts if we had to add Gordon Soli and Jim Ross, the first two, you know. Uh, there was talk about you beating out Jim Ross last year. Oh, come on. You should discuss that on your podcast. Oh, it's it in passing. Uh, like, hey, JR, did you know that I was actually almost ahead of you? In uh, my goodness. Thing? What's wrong with y'all? Y'all are trying to get me in trouble. Yeah, well, of course we are. That's what we do here. So, in, anyway, the, the vote come up, and then this year it was unanimous. Last year, when we put you up against JR, I got to tell you, you didn't get a lot of votes against JR. <laughs> as I shouldn't. As I shouldn't. But this year, you know, Jr. and I kind of stacked the deck where there wasn't no Jrs involved in it, so we could kind of get you. Uh, well, thank you, that. But it, anyway, it was unanimous vote for you. Everybody has tremendous respect for what you've done because, you know, like I said, times have changed. You don't only get your 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 brassing news now from from a sheet. Now you can turn on uh, Conrad uh, Empire there any day of the week and, and get get first-hand knowledge of what's going on there. So congratulations. You were unanimous in the choice there. Everybody's looking forward to meeting you up there, Conrad. It's going to be a great weekend. I can't wait to be there. I've never been. My whole family's coming. We're excited. And uh, I got a ragtag bunch of friends who are going to come and we're going to invade Waterloo. It's going to be fun. Awesome. And you've got a wonderful person in, inducting you and one of our good friends as well, uh, Mr. Brother Love, Bruce Pritchard. 
Absolutely. Who better, you know, when, when I, I wasn't sure if that's even a thing you got to do. So I talked to some of the organizers there, Mr. Troy, and he said, yeah, you can pick who wants to induct you. And I said, well, the Bruce Pritchard show is really what got all this rolling. What about brother love himself? And he goes, oh, that'd be great. And of course I had to make sure I could clear it with the boss and Bruce is coming. I can't believe it. Bruce and Waterloo. Here we come. Yeah, Bruce is excited about it too. Bruce yeah. has been wanting to come out. I think if Bruce is going to go up there and, and really get on you about you beating him into the hall. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so we're, we're going to have a ball up there. John John has some special moments from Waterloo also that uh, Do I he, ever. Pro he probably won't share with you all there, but when we get off there, you, I'll be happy to share all there. You, 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 you can share with Conrad what not to do at Waterloo. It's one of the greatest stories. <laughs> ever okay ever. I, can't wait. I can't wait and of course uh, mr briscoe was involved <laughs> well imagine that <laughs> so conrad I, I saw a thing with warren Sapp the other day he was talking about guys who first ballot hall of famers uh defensive linemen and he said there's only been five he mentioned uh, the guys i can't remember all of them uh you know you can go off the top of the you, list you can you can figure out you know who they are because they're talking about aaron donald is he among the all-time greats he's the greatest of all time and he goes, well, once you include him, he'll be first ballot Hall of Famer. He'll be one of six. He goes, I'll, I'll go with any of those six. You're going in as a unanimous pick into the Hall of Fame. That's is that to you something that either either you're either just incredulous? Is it kind of vindication? How how do you feel about going in as a unanimous pick, the same as Jim Ross and Gordon Sully? Uh, unworthy. It doesn't feel real. I. Uh... You know, this was, I'm just a fan and I'm just happy to be here and I'm just having fun and trying to, you know, create some moments and create a little community. And we've been fortunate enough and lucky enough to do it. I'm just incredibly blessed and thankful, but I still don't think I deserve it. I can't believe this is a real sentence. Like if someone was in my position, I'd look at it kind of sideways and say, uh, does that guy really need to be in the hall of fame? But yeah, here I am. And I'm damn sure not saying no. So thank you. I'm glad to have the opportunity. <laughs> well, we think you deserve to be in there. I think it's an honor that's uh, overdue and I think it's well-deserved. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate you saying that. Conrad, I want to ask you about something I, I find very interesting about you and that's uh, your college days when you were sitting there and you're starting to start up the mortgage business. Uh, you mm -hmm. told me about it a couple of times. It, uh, to me, it's just fascinating about the fact that you decide one day, you know what? College may not be for me. I'm going to go make real money. Tell us yeah. about that process that you had in college going into your mortgage business. Well, I knew I was going to be in sales. Uh, everybody in my family was an entrepreneur. My, my grandmother was an entrepreneur on both sides. Uh, my mom's dad was an entrepreneur. My aunts and uncles on that side were, and then my mom and dad both had a couple of businesses. So I thought, Hey, I'm just going to get into sales and do business. I don't know that I necessarily want to get a college degree and, and go work a job, but that's what you're supposed to do. Right. So, uh, I was fortunate enough and, and lucky enough to get a scholarship to our local community college when I was a sophomore in high school. And I thought that would allow me to work in some of the family businesses. Uh, and, and I could just go do that. And so, uh, that was the plan. And then my second year, uh, Van Scott, who was our business teacher, I took a lot of business classes with him at Sneed state community college there in Boaz, Alabama. He said something like, uh, now listen, five years from now, if you work hard, keep your head down and your nose clean, some of you could make up to $35,000 a year. And this was September or October. And I reached in my book bag and I had my most recent pay stub and I had my year to date on there. And so after the, the, the class sort of cleaned out, I went up to Mr. Scott and I said, Hey, I, I think I'm, I think I'm done. And he goes, Oh, are you going to drop this class? I said, no, I think I'm done coming to school. And he says, what do you mean? And I showed him my pay stub. And he looked down and he said, son, you make more money than me. Why are you still here? And slapped <laughs> me on the back and that was it. And so I, I thought I had to go to school to learn how to make money, but I was already doing it with sales. And then I managed to uh, move to Huntsville and got recruited into the mortgage business. And I didn't even know I'm 20 at the time. I had just turned 20. My first day was August 27th, 2001. And, uh, just two months prior I turned 20. And so when the guy's recruiting me, I don't even know how to spell mortgage. I don't even know there's two G's in it, but I'm used to selling people stuff. So I'm used to, when you sell someone stuff, it costs money. The idea that people paid a lower payment and, and, and saved money. And yet I still made money just blew my mind. Like, okay, but normally I make a commission cause I sell someone a car or a house or a, or a boat or a whatever. So now they have a new payment associated with it. 
these people are saving money and I'm making money. And they go, yeah. And I said, okay, I, I quit. I'm doing mortgages now. So that was my first day. And, uh, I was lucky enough to not know any better. And I think that's been a big key to my success. And, and I want that to be the message. If that's what we're talking about today is entrepreneurship is don't not knowing any better is a great thing. It's an advantage. Sometimes when you know everything, you kind of outsmart yourself and you tell yourself all the reasons it won't work. Well, what's wrong with just trying? What's wrong with just getting out of your comfort zone and just trying and doing your best. So for instance, that first day, I didn't know what to do. So when I got an application, I just kept working and got another one. So the guy, the little branch manager comes around, great guy, my mentor, Jeff comes around and says, well, how'd we do? And I said, I only got eight. And he starts screaming, you got eight. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. It's my first day. I'll do better tomorrow. He goes, you got eight. And I go, yeah, I'm sorry. This is my first day. I I'll try to do 13 tomorrow. Tell me what I can do better. And he goes, you were supposed to get one and bring it to me. Most people only get one. I didn't know that. I didn't know any better. So I got eight. So my second month, full month there, I set the all-time company record and wow. turns out I was okay at it. But the deal was, I didn't know you're supposed to get an application and then go talk to everybody in the office about it and then process it and figure out what program it should fit in and why and how and where. And then let's talk about the game last night and where we're going for lunch and let's go to happy hour. I didn't do any of that. I just sat at my desk and banged it out. And I managed to be really good at it just because I didn't know any better. So that's my message, I guess. So, Not so you, so you closed eight mortgages without approval from, from their mortgage company. Then. Well, I took, I took eight applications. You and, took eight, and so you, you didn't, you didn't say, okay, congratulations. You got the no, mortgage. Okay. No, I just said, Hey, I'll work on it and I'll call, I'll get a plan together and I'll call you back tomorrow. But I literally didn't know what the hell I was doing. So Jeff had to help me structure all eight and figure out what we could or couldn't do. I'm sure somewhere approved somewhere, all that. But I wasn't worried about, I got one. Now let's see what happens. Yeah. Like the deal is like, if you're a fisherman, Hey man, if the fish are biting, just keep casting, yeah. don't catch one and then go back in. What the hell? Just keep going. Let's, let's keep going. So that was the deal. The fish were biting that day and I, I kept casting. What were you working for in, in Boaz in junior college? Uh, business. I was going, I was going to get, no, a I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What we, what sales outside sales that you were, you were oh, getting? direct sales. My dad had sold a bunch of different stuff. He sold tabletop advertising. He sold vacuum cleaners. He sold insurance. My whole family had just been littered with sales. I had an aunt who sold cars. So it was, I knew it was going to be something sales, uh, but no matter what it was, I just knew, Hey, the people who make the most money in the world, unless you own the thing are the salespeople. Uh, and, and that has rang true through my entire life. Like the highest paid people in almost any industry I've looked at are the people who own it or the people who are dragging in the revenue, the salespeople. And I was glad to be one of those guys. And the pay stub that you showed the, the professor, wh where was that from? What sales, what sales were you working for then? Uh, vacuum cleaners. Vacuum, wow. Yeah. Sell, selling them for, uh, door to door or how we, were you selling them? We were say, it was all based on referrals, but it was rainbow vacuum cleaners. The ones that had the water in the bottom instead of a regular bag or whatever. And you know, it was like October and I'd made 60 grand. So the guy was like hey, 60 uh, grand on vacuum cleaners at 19 years old. Yeah. Wow. wow. <laughs> hey, Jerry, wasn't, wasn't Vince at one time a vacuum clean cell? I, I believe so. I was yeah. a full of brush man back in my college, in my freshman year of college. I, I showed full of brush. I've moved to Oklahoma city and I got me a job with full of brush and I, I got kicked out of every house that I went to, I think. <laughs> I didn't do too well. I got fired from that. that was my first job I ever got fired from a bit of full of brush man. So you had to have some, some talent there to, to close out or, or, or to take out eight applications for mortgages. Well, what's funny is I, I, uh, I rewrote the sales book, you know, anytime you were trying to sell it, they call it direct sales. So if you were selling, cause I didn't do what like Kirby guys did and just knock on people's door. I would sell somebody one and they'd say, Oh, my sister-in-law Rhonda, she would love this. Go talk to her. So I did. Uh, but what I saw was everybody was just like reading by the book and they'd flip a page and they did that, whether they were selling cookware or they were selling vacuum cleaners or whatever. And I'm like, that's not how you sell. You sell by just having a conversation with people. I don't know what everybody wants. I need to ask questions. So my dad taught me very young telling ain't selling the idea being ask questions. And, and once I understood that, and the other thing he taught me is if you want somebody to do something, you got to make it their idea. So those two things I applied and I totally rewrote the pitch book and I was, I managed to be decent at it. So I became a sales trainer and won a bunch of sales awards and training awards at 19 years old. Cause I sort of rewrote the pitch book. But then when I saw mortgages, it was like, Hey, listen, it was, it was fine. It was fun selling vacuum cleaners, I guess. 
but that was the thing I think that made me successful in mortgages. So sometimes the thing you're doing isn't really the thing you're supposed to be doing, but it helps you get there. And that was at least my story. I mean, I only did it for two years, I guess. And then I was in mortgages and never looked back. Yeah. That's what we've always talked about on here is, you know, the, the current group of wrestlers don't have that educational background of having to work in so many different places and in, in territories and stuff. It, it's a big disadvantage. And yes. It's much harder on the current group than it is on say me and Jerry's generation that had to work so hard to get us to a certain place. You had the same thing. You had a huge educational, you weren't going to college, but you were learning what you needed to learn selling vacuum cleaners. Yes. And a lot of it came from just talking to these folks on the phone, you know, cause we didn't door knock, as you said, like Kirby did or whatever. So it would just be a conversation about, Hey, I was out visiting with your sister-in-law Rhonda and I, I showed her something she was really excited about. And she thought you had to see it. Would you be available? You know? And so then I would just try to set an appointment to leverage that relationship. And so she's obviously going to hang up and call Rhonda and make sure it's okay. And say, Oh girl, you got to see it. This is amazing. Cause I, I had a really happy customer. So then I just go to the next one and then go to the next one. And, and that was it. But that phone conversation, like that's really what a lot of salespeople struggle with. Like the heaviest thing in their office is that little plastic receiver. Nobody wants to pick it up. My dad used to say the hardest door to open is your car door because everybody's nervous and they don't want to actually do it. You just got to get over that. And so I think getting that out of my system, getting my nose out of the way, not my NOSE, but just the NO, understanding like if you sit down at a blackjack table, you're not going to win every hand right? You're going to win some, you're going to lose some. You hope you lose the small bets. You hope you win the big bets. Well, once you understand what your closing ratio is, I'm going to sell one out of three or one out of four or one out of two or whatever it is. Just know those no's are going to come and the yeses will be there. But if you get discouraged after the first one, man, you're going to suck at life. Like not just sales, like everybody's bad at something before they get good at something. Yeah. And then it just becomes an algebraic equation, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, if you know you're gonna, so what? Right. So if you know you're going to average 33% of sales, one out of three, you, then if you do 300, you're going to get around 100. If you do 30, you're going to get around 10. It's just. And, and the thing is, John, they, they think it goes like that. They think it's yes, no, no, yes, no, no, yes. That's not the way it is. So if you get six no's in a row, you might get four yeses in a row. Don't get too high and mighty. Don't get too low. Stay even keel, stay the course, get your nose out of the way. The yeses will be there. And that's really what sales was for me. So I don't take rejection personally, which is why I'm, I'm comfortable, I guess, doing these podcasts. And, and a lot of people freeze up when the red lights on, I'm not saying I'm like really good at it. I'm just saying, I don't give a shit. I know it's going to, Hey, it's going to be what it is. And people, some are going to like it. Some are going to hate it. So what I did what I was supposed to do. See you tomorrow. Well, one thing I'm surprised at in this conversation here that JBL, John Layfield, actually put me in the same generation as him. Thank you, John. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if you'd catch that because as soon as I said it, I thought, should I put a caveat on that? <laughs> Did I not? That's the first time you've ever you, you've ever put me in the same generation as you. I appreciate that. So, so. <laughs> okay, I, I, you know what? I'm actually going to edit that out. That's uh, not gonna... no, you better. Not... <laughs> that's, not not that, that's what I deal with. He's got that button, that magic button that you guys in control always have. You know, the control guys always have that magic button. You can't win with John. But anyway, you know. <laughs> As you as you're moving along, were your peers that you know you're working at this company were they coming to you, Conrad? What are you doing? Were you were you were they asking for advice? Because you're the kid, young kid on the block. Uh, no, not at first. Uh, not everybody was happy to see that. You know, <laughs> were I, they I, slashing I, your tires? Is it, did they go yeah. the other way? <laughs> well, they weren't slashing my tires, but it certainly was. Uh, and, and listen, I'm sure that exists with everybody who has some success when they're 19 or 20. Maybe even if you don't, you think you know everything. So you're the smartest guy in the room, blah, blah, blah. So I had some really hard and fast opinions about the way things should be done. You get a little older and you realize, man, there's a million ways to skin a cat. As we like to say here in the South, it doesn't really matter how you do it. We should, we should judge based on results, but that is the way I kept myself motivated because I wanted to win. Like I was the kid, if we were playing Nintendo and you beat me, I'm going to keep playing until I win. I got to get good at this. I can't lose. I'm very competitive in that regard. So once I started selling mortgages, they used to have like a big board in the office and it would keep track of all the files. So the processors and underwriters, they could keep up with what's next and what documents do we need? Like, do we need a tax return or do we need a new bank statement or whatever? And so I saw that and realized, okay, I want to have more than everybody else on the board. And then it was, okay, now I want to have more than everybody else on the board combined. All right. Now I want my own board. 
And so th- th- I just had to keep gamifying it because I didn't want, I've always felt like when you're competitive on some level, you're letting somebody else really determine your income. And my, my best example of that as a kid, I was watching an NFL films back when that was a thing. And they had a great shot of Jerry Rice running towards the end zone. And he's running as fast as he can. And the camera's in the end zone. And you could see his eyes look over his left shoulder and look over his right shoulder. And I was asking dad, why is he doing that? And he said, and I'll never forget. He said, he's trying to see how fast he needs to run. And I thought, okay, so he could run faster. He's not running as fast as he can. He's trying to run as fast as he needs to, to beat that guy. Well, that almost means like, if you're trying to, I got to beat John in mortgage sales this month in a weird way, John just became your boss. He dictated your income. You want to make one more dollar than him. I don't want John to be my boss. I want to make as much money as I can, not necessarily $1 more than John. That's, that's not for me. So I just kept moving that goalpost saying, all right, I got more than everybody. Now let's see if I can get more than everybody together combined. And that sort of thinking has, I guess, given me success in sales and business, but it's not healthy. So if you're not in that business, don't do it. You will become obsessed with it and become one track minded and you will wear yourself out doing it, but it worked for me. But isn't an obsession a sign of also of greatness? I mean, everybody who became great is obsessed, right? So yeah. obsession is not necessarily a bad term, depending upon what you want. Yes. No, I totally agree. I just know that, you know, I sacrificed some stuff along the way. Like I didn't have any fun in my twenties. Like there's a whole gap of time where I never listened to music on the radio. It was all just sales or motivational training and tapes and stuff. And I mean, I was married back before, way back when, and that lasted like 11 months. Cause I didn't give a shit about anything, but working. And I was so focused on that. Hey, if there's time for other stuff, great. And if there's not, that's okay. I had to eventually find some sort of balance, but it was stuff like, you know, I used to like playing Madden football games and stuff. And I have all the systems here in my house, but they haven't been turned on since 08 and they won't again. Like I had to put that down. I don't do that anymore. I've got one track mind. I'm focused on this. If it doesn't make me money or it's not fun, I'm not doing it. And making money is pretty fun. So I keep doing it. <laughs> me and Mr. Briscoe have a big gap of time in, in our youth too, but it was because we did, we were having fun. There it, you was, go. It, it was <laughs> because of work. That's for sure. <laughs> no, so no. I did all that in my thirties. So I had a lot of fun in my thirties. <laughs> you, you made up, you made up for it in your thirties. More than made up for it. Yes. sir. Conrad, when, when you were 21, you're a couple months in the mortgage business and you're the number one selling person after a couple months, was there animosity in the office? Yes. All the old people hated me for sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and no, no. did it manifest itself in overt ways other than just the side eye glance? Um, yeah. I mean, listen, they, um, you know, people might fuck with my desk or whatever, or they'd know I parked in a certain spot and they'd mess with it or whatever. Uh, you know, they had the locks changed a few times and shit like that. <laughs> somebody lost the key. Just silly shit like that. I didn't take it personally, but you know, my thing is, you know, they were all, there's a lot of folks out there who are salespeople who just want to look busy. So they think as long as I got up and shaved and ironed my shirt and I'm at the office by eight and I got my cup of coffee, I'm working. Well, the reality is nobody wants to talk to you about a mortgage at 8 AM on a Tuesday. That's not when people have free time. They too are working. So I would come in later and I would stay until eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night. And so they got annoyed that, oh, I guess he just thinks he can come in whenever he wants. Yeah, but you're leaving at 4:55, and I'm still going to be here for four more hours, and, and I'm actually going to be productive in my four hours, whereas you were just picking your nose this morning. So that annoyed them, but you know, in the end, I'm still doing mortgages, and they work for Orkin. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, at what point did you decide I'm really good at selling mortgages? I want to be my own boss. Uh, almost immediately I realized, Hey, uh, I, I only have so much capacity. There's only so many hours in the day. And I, I kept gamifying that for a while. I'm going to say the first two years, I was just pushing myself to do as much as I could, but then I realized I probably need a team. So I, I said, Hey, I want to start my own office and, and, and be a branch manager. So I did that a couple of years in, and then eventually thought, man, I, I really just kind of want to chart my own course. I want to develop my own thing. So I did that for several years and then, you know, I'm still doing it. So I was probably four years in before I got really serious about, I want to do my own thing. And uh, I was fortunate enough to, to buy in and and be a big buy into a bigger part, a bigger thing. I don't know, seven, eight years later. So yeah, I've had a lot of fun with it. I've been doing it 22 years this year and don't imagine I'll ever stop. Did you ever go back or did a college professor that you told that you wanted to do your own, but did they ever come to you and say, Conrad, you've been fair. 
would you like to share that knowledge with my class or did you ever have a relationship with that at university after you dropped out? They did reach out to me and ask me to come speak. Uh, I, I, I agreed. And then my grandmother died the uh, day before I was supposed to go. So I had to cancel. Uh, and I never got a chance to do that. So if Van Scott's still around and wants me to come holler at him and Sneed, I'd be glad to. Here's what a small world it is too. Morgan, my wife, Megan's daughter, that I'm happy to be her bonus dad. She just, she graduated from Charlotte and then uh, went down to uh, Tuscaloosa. So she's going to school at the university of Alabama where I've had season tickets for 20 years, <laughs> but she's such an overachiever. She's going to summer school to try to get some more classes in. She wants to get done as quick as she can. She'd like to be a doctor and blah, blah, blah. So she signed up for classes at Sneed State Community College. What are the odds that a girl from Charlotte, North Carolina is going to the exact same community college in Boaz, Alabama that I did? Now she's do it, doing it remote, but still it counts. What a small world, man. That's neat. That's really a neat story too. Uh, hey, how, how cool is it that your professor though, Van Scott, uh, would tell you, you know, you, you can make more money. Why are you in college? You know, a lot of professors would not have said that. No. That's I mean, actually pretty cool. I, I think if it was any other, if he was a professor for any other topic or subject, that might not have been the case, but in business, people go, go to school to get a business degree because they want to try to figure out how to make as much money as they can. And it's like, okay, if that's the plan, if that's the idea, Hey kid, you got it figured out, go do more of that. And that was pretty cool. So it worked out. So without giving away any like proprietary, obviously, but your, your yeah. business now you have your offices there and you have. The, the staff how many people you have working for you do you do you still enjoy it oh i love it i love it i mean this has been the last 13 months have been the most challenging months we've ever had in the mortgage business because as you guys know the federal reserve has just continually raised rates trying to offset inflation and that's really crunched margins so where now rates are higher than they were and margins are lower than they were and it's hard to really get a read on on why or what that is uh, but as we're recording, they just decided yesterday, we're not going to raise it this time, but we are going to raise it again, two more times this year. So that's, uh, I guess the old expression is sort of like kissing your sister. It's kind of good, but kind of not, I don't know. So it's like, I don't really know what to make of the mortgage business right now, but I don't know anything else. So I'm going to keep doing it, but figuring out ways to help people save money and to help them improve their credit. Like. I think it's crazy that we go to school and we all learn who Napoleon is, but we don't know how to get a credit score or how to buy a house or how to balance a checkbook. Like when's the last time anybody even talked about balancing a checkbook. And I'm not saying that's the thing we do anymore now, but there's just none of that base level knowledge passed down. And the idea that I get to help people, it happens every week where there's somebody who's been renting maybe the same house for 10 years. They could have damn near owned the thing by now. They just didn't know any better. And to see that light bulb moment go for them, and to get families out of apartments, get those kids a yard and they can have a dog and grass. And man, it's just, it's the most rewarding thing I can imagine doing. I still, you know, you know Conrad, my wife was, was a finance teacher and John was kind enough one time to come down and talk about the stock market and, 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 uh, and, uh, finance with, with, uh, my wife's kids there, but she said the same thing. The kids don't know how to, how to, how to balance those checkbooks. They don't, they don't know how to exist in everyday life. And that was part of her curriculum. She basically rewrote the curriculum that, uh, that in the course that she was teaching there to teach them how to how to balance a checkbook, to teach them the everyday thing. That's so missing in, in today's society there, and and that's a shame. It is a shame, and the real shame is that you know there's a lot of people out there who who don't think home ownership is for them. But I never have I ever heard a landlord say these words. We've thought about it, and we've decided next year we're going to lower your rent. That's never happened ever. Like it just goes up every single year and you got to decide what side of that table do you want to be on the guy who's getting paid more every year or the guy who's coming out of pocket more every year because home values typically go up every single year. I know there was the 2008 anomaly, but it hasn't happened before or since it's still a very safe real estate investment or maybe the safest investment I know of, but a lot of folks say, well, it's not for me. And they just continue to flush their money away, not knowing. You can write off the interest, the home values go up. You can depreciate stuff, blah, blah, blah. So I just love helping people figure that out, especially folks who think, well, that's not for me. Yes, it is. It's for everyone. Like when people come try to sell me advertising, they say, who's your target demo? Adult humans. <laughs> yeah. Everybody needs a place to live, man. Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Conrad, you're selling this great product. You're doing incredibly well at it. Why would you get involved with a podcast? 
total accident man you know I, I was sort of a lapsed fan in wrestling I, I was out in vegas with some of my friends at the end of 2012 we were out there for the ufc and uh, i'm just scrolling ebay on my ipad just killing time until we're ready to go to the fight or whatever we were doing and i see that someone was selling an actual rick flair robe like not a replica but like the real one from tv i thought man that'd be like owning one of elvis's jumpsuits that'd be like the <laughs> coolest thing ever Cause I, I knew, I mean, I had the house I'm in now and I've got like a sports memorabilia room downstairs with like some Tyson trunks and Ali trunks and a bunch of jerseys and baseball bats and all that. And I'm like, man, that'd be cool to have one of these robes. So I started negotiating with the guy and I got it. And so now that I get it here, it's like, what the hell do you do with this now <laughs> yeah. that you have it? Like it was cool to get, and I love the chase, but now that I have it, like, how do you display this? Like there's a case you can put jerseys in or bats in or balls in. There are no wrestling robe cases. That's not a thing. So I'm like, uh, I guess this sounds stupid, but maybe I get a mannequin, but then it would be like, well, that'd be kind of weird. Maybe I need a replica belt for it. So I messaged a guy, I did a little research and found Dave Milliken, who, as it turns out, lives in Tennessee, not too far from me. And I said, Hey man, I'm looking for the most authentic big gold belt. And he sold me one. He said, okay, well, you can take an order and make a deposit and all that jazz. And so the next day I'm just scrolling his pictures on his website and I come across a picture of the Ric Flair nameplate, like the original one, the real one. So I reach out and I said, Hey man, uh, hypothetically speaking, do you have that? And is that for sale? Cause I'd be a buyer. And he goes, no, unfortunately my friend has it and he'll never sell it. And I said, okay, well, hypothetically, if he changes his mind, here's how much I'd offer. Two days later, he says, Hey, turns out never sell it is today. Here's his information. So I bought the nameplate. So the guy was Dick Bourne. And he wrote a bunch of books on, on classic championship belts. He's even actually in the Waterloo hall of fame. He got the Mel B award. So the 10 pounds of gold book they had done a few years before. And he said, I always wanted to do the big gold book. If we ever find the big gold belt, will you let me photograph it and loan me this nameplate? I go, yeah, but I'm going to find it. And he said, how do you know? And I said, I don't know. I just know I am. So I started looking and I found it. And then I found the original leather and I put it all together. So through this process, I just got back into wrestling sort of accidentally. I love the chase of finding this old memorabilia and they were doing a Kickstarter at the time, uh, to raise money for, uh, an ECW documentary called barbed wire city and John Filipovich put it together. And one of the top perks were, uh, if you're like the top donor, which I think was 2,500 or maybe it was five grand, whatever it was, you not only got a, uh, a private screening of the movie before it came out and a bunch of posters and other blah, blah. But they'll bring an ECW wrestler of your choosing to your house to screen it. And I grew up a big ECW fan. And I'm like, man, that'd be awesome. So I did it, invited like eight of my buddies over. Shane Douglas came over, watched the movie with us. We got to pick his brain for a bit. And I was like, man, that was kind of fun. That was like a shoot interview with no cameras. That was pretty cool. And somehow, some way, uh, I got introduced to Jim Cornette, who then introduced me to JJ Dillon, who then introduced me to Ric Flair, blah, 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 blah. And so I became pals with Rick. Unfortunately, it was around the same time that Reed had passed away. Rick was probably drinking too much. Rick was probably looking for a friend. And one of my buddies said, Hey man, how many times are you going to go to Atlanta and get drunk with Rick Flair? Uh, every time I'm going to go every time. This is super fucking cool that Rick Flair wants to get drunk and watch the draft with me. I'm going. So we're hanging out. We become buddies. And he says, Hey man, my agent, Melinda at the time, got an offer from CBS to do a podcast. What's a podcast. So I explained it and he goes, show me on my phone and I show him, can you make any money with that? And I said, well, I think so. Here's the way it works, blah, blah, blah. So he signs the deal is a little nervous about it and calls me and says, it just feels weird to just talk into a microphone. And I'm like, what do you mean? You're Ric Flair. That shouldn't be an issue for you. And he goes, no, I want to bounce it off of somebody. Can you just come into the studio that first time and ask me fan questions just so I'm comfortable. I go, yeah, that'd be great. So I go over there and they have a board op and a guy named Seth who ran the whole thing. And they're like, who the hell is this guy talking about me? But I came in prepared. I had notes. It was a bigger font so he could see it. I had things bold and highlighted. I handed it to the board op. I handed it to Rick and I had one. And at the end of the show, they were like, uh, can you come back next week? So I became an accidental podcaster. And after about four episodes, I realized, Hey, wait a minute. I've been spending a hundred grand a month to promote my mortgage company in Huntsville, Nashville, and Chattanooga. Everybody in the freaking world is listening to this and I'm not paying for it. I need to get licensed in all those other States. And I need to, I need to just double down on this because this is free advertising that I'll eventually get paid doing. And then I get to talk about my mortgage company for free. The light bulb went off and I was all in. So through Rick's show, 
I got to interview everybody, Jim Ross, Eric Bischoff, Tony Schiavone, Bruce Pritchard. And when Eric, when, when Rick sort of lost interest in continuing podcasting, it wasn't fun anymore. It wasn't paying the way he thought it would, or whatever the case may be. I sold Bruce on it and Bruce was like, okay, let's do it. And I'll be damned. It worked. You know, we no longer did a guest format. We just did one topic long form enjoyed really fast success. And then I thought, well, if the WWF side works, let's try it with WCW. So we do it with Shivani and then Bischoff and then JR. And now I'm in too damn deep, John, I'm supposed to be <laughs> doing mortgages and I'm too deep. Uh, well, Bruce told us uh, the, the story of, about you and him uh, getting, how did you get hooked up with Bruce? Was it through Jim Cornette or Ric Flair? Or how Ric Flair. It? So he was on the Ric Flair. He was on Rick's podcast as a guest. And, uh, we had done the Cornette thing and, and done the, uh, Shane Douglas thing. So I said, Hey, can you give me uh Bruce Pritchard's phone number? So Rick texts me right away. So I called and pitched Bruce. Bruce came over. We shot the shit, had a good time. And then after all my friends left, uh, he sat downstairs in my living room and looked over and said, what the fuck do you do? And I said, what do you mean? Cause we have a nice house. You're not very old. How are you here? And I explained it. And so we talked about how that worked and he kind of was looking for something to do and thought, man, we should figure something out. Well, then I was actually doing a recruiting initiative to grow new markets and new branches. And I said, Hey, I'm going to have to shoot some video who better to produce these sales videos than Bruce Pritchard. So I flew him in. We worked on the project, held a big rally thing in Nashville, grew a whole branch. It was successful. And I said, Hey, we need to do more of this. So he started coming in about. Once a month, spend a week with me. We'd work on different landing pages, shoot a bunch of different videos. It was working. But at the end of the night, after everything's done, we're finished with our work. I'd say something like, Hey man, whatever happened when the, or what happened when the radicals jumped from WCW to the WWF and he adjusted in his seat and he goes, well, here's the thing. And he just starts talking. And at the end I said, dude, that's a podcast. And he said, what? And I said, what we just did, if we were to record that. Everybody would want to listen to that. He goes, no, nobody wants to hear my story. So I go, yeah, they do. They don't know that you know, you have that story. They think they'd have to get that story from Eddie Guerrero or somebody else, but you know, that story, you were there. We should do a podcast. And he had done one before. And he said, nobody's going to listen. You can't make any money. And I'm like, dude, you just got a t-shirt store on pro wrestling tees. Let's just do it. You'll sell a whole bunch of t-shirts. You'll get your stories out there. Maybe we'll sell some sponsors. And then I can plug my mortgage company <laughs> and eventually I beat him down and he said, okay, we'll do it. And we did, and it worked. And now we keep doing it. That's it. Wow. So the success of the first podcast, cause I've heard Bruce tell a story. Bruce was just blown away by it. He, he literally did not think anybody would listen to it. No, he didn't. And, and at the time, you know, we didn't know anything about podcasting or, or, or the back end as far as how do you monetize it? What are the platforms? How, how's the RSS distributed? Like, None of that stuff did we have a handle on, but I knew court Bauer knew. So I called court and they had worked together before on the WWE side. I don't think they had the best working relationship, but <laughs> he knew that I had done the Ric Flair show. So he goes, Hey, if Conrad likes it, let's roll the dice. We'll do it. So we did. And, and court had set an expectation that if you guys get 10,000 downloads, you know, that's, that's pretty good. And if you can get to 30,000, then you can start making some real money. But we had like. 300,000 downloads very fast. Wow. Wow. Uh, and, and we were both hitting refresh at the time. There was this great show on uh, AMC and I forget the name of it, but it was about the, the tech boom in the eighties. And Bruce and I were just junkies for the show. We're watching it in my home theater basement. And we're both just hitting refresh on audio boom at the time. Like these numbers can't be real. This has got to be wrong. So let, we messaged them like, Hey, did y'all like miss a decimal? Like you got to something's up. And they're like, no, that's right. And so around that same time, right, right around the same time we're launching the show is when all the T and a mess with Billy Corgan and Dixie Carter and all that happened. And those episodes cracked a million. And we just could not believe like a million people listen to this. Like our goal was 10,000 and a million people wow. listen wow. to it. So by the, by January, I, I sent an email to, um, uh, gosh, what was it? What was their name? Oh, I, I forget. I forget the name of it, but I said, Hey, here's our, uh, cause I couldn't get any traction. Like, how do we make real money with this? I don't know yet, but we had done like 2.9 million impressions in that last calendar month of, of J in the last 30 days from wherever it was in January through December. And they replied immediately and said, when can we jump on a call? They gave us a guarantee and a big lump sum to sign. 
And we said, Hey, the only way we'll do this is if you bring everybody else on the MLW radio network, they did. So Cornette and everybody else's podcast came along with us and we all started making money together and here we go. There you go. You know, I don't think I've ever been happier for a guy's success as, as I have been for Bruce's. Yes. So yeah. Bruce is Same. such a, a good person and so, and there's such a smart guy as everybody knows, but you really helped Bruce out with this. Yeah. You know, Bruce helped himself. I understand all yeah. that, but yeah. I am so, I was so thrilled when Bruce did the podcast and, and the success came so quickly as it did, which didn't surprise people like me and Jerry and, right. and you, Con, I'm right. sure Conrad, right. We know, we know how entertaining he is. He's entertained us forever. We, That's why we, we, we heard those podcasts every night on the road when we traveled. Yeah. That's <laughs> right. So he asked do, me one day, he goes, know know how entertaining he no. was. <laughs> I said, no, Bruce, I was there. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And I've heard the story, but th yeah. it's fantastic. I mean, yeah. Bruce is as entertaining and smart. Yeah. Like you talk about it producing your commercials. Oh he's yeah. The best producers there is. Bruce is just good at almost everything he's ever done. Absolutely. And he loves Except karate. We, we have, we have, lots of, <laughs> we, we have hey, Johnny five time hall of famer karate. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> five time, five you know, times. He's in more hall of fame than Chuck Norris. <laughs> it's Tell amazing. Me that's not me. a work Conrad. Tell me that's not a work. When, when I went to his, uh, you know, he moved to Connecticut a few years ago and I went up for his 60th birthday earlier this year, as you guys did. And so I'm seeing the Pritchard estate for the first time and he's got like the formal office and then the real office. He's got a whole wing over there and he's got just floor to ceiling, cool wrestling stuff. And I yeah. see, and he points because he sees me looking at it and he goes, yep, there they are right there. That's my karate black belt hall of fame plaque. And I go, where's the rest of it? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, I'm looking for the canceled check. Is it on the back or what? He, made a donation for that. he didn't think that was funny at all. <laughs> he, he, he does. He has no sense of humor. No, no. You know, speaking, speaking of Bruce and, and your, your, your stable of, of podcast stars you have is, is all hall of famers. And, and John and I are good friends. We're fortunately to be good friends with every one of them. Uh, we would like to know how the hell do you manage all those egos? Because we know there's egos involved in those guys. And there's got, there's got to be disagreements coming, not with each other, but with the, with the concept of the, how do you manage that Conrad? Man, I'll be honest. I think, uh, once, once they uh, know, like, and trust me, yeah. you know, they kind of don't, it, it's easy. Like I know what to not do and I know what to not say. Like I look at the whole podcast opportunity as I'm John Stockton, they're Carl Malone. I'm here to get them the ball. I'm here to make them look good. So I, I just want to talk just enough to tee them up and let them shine and do that, tell their story. And that's the star. And as long as I'm trying to get them the ball over and over, man, that yeah. seems to work. But I know like there's certain things I can't ask JR about. I mean, I could, but that might be our last podcast yeah. or I put him in a bad spot where he can't really answer and be honest. And what I don't want to do is intentionally bullshit on the podcast. Now there might be some things we have to dance around or be cute around, but there's probably some legal stuff every now and again that I'm sure fans would love to hear, but you just can't share everything. Right. So I try to figure out where the line is. And as time's gone on, I've gotten better and I could admit there was an episode where I was reading directly out of a book that I thought, well, it's in print. It can't be that big a deal. It can't be that bad. It was less than awesome. Uh, I didn't think about <laughs> it. I mean, I, I'll be honest at the time. I didn't understand the difference between how few people had read that book and how many people were listening to our podcast and how that could affect other interested parties in that story. Once I understood that it kind of clicked for me and I try not to do it now. Like I don't, I'm so I'm trying to help add value to wrestling. I don't want to tear it down. I don't, I want to be a value add. Like, like if it's good for wrestling then I want to do it, if it's bad for wrestling, I'd probably rather not. And which is why I don't talk about current stuff. I mean, I, I watch a lot of current stuff. I'm sure you guys do too. I like some stuff. I don't like other stuff. I try not to talk about the stuff I don't like. Those are young guys and girls trying to make a living, trying to learn. I don't want to pile on and be the guy who's trying to pull them down when they're trying to climb up. Now, can I say as a kid, I didn't like Brutus, the freaking barber beefcake. Yeah. He ain't working today. That's fine. Uh, but like the guys and gals who are doing their thing today, I don't really want to be negative about that. That's not, that's not my lane. What has been the most thing that surprised you doing this? Like talking about certain time periods, certain things, certain events, what surprised you most? I mean, I think at the time, you know, I, I had only ever experienced wrestling as a fan and I'm still a fan. But now that I'm creating so much content, someone might discover a podcast and they will just randomly tweet me because they just heard it. 
and they'll have a very specific question. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't remember because in my head, hell, I recorded that eight months ago, but I used to be kind of incredulous talking to Bruce. Like, how could you not remember this? And it's 25, 30 years ago. And he was doing a show every <laughs> single day. So of course he sort of lost track, but that to me was such a big deal. It meant so much to me. That's like, how could you not remember that vivid as vividly as I do this one little nugget that apparently meant a lot to me, but not him. Uh, but it's just like, man, time flies. It's not an age thing. It's just, you're doing one thing after another. It's just yeah. going to feel a little less important. Like not saying that ugly, but I'm saying like Taylor Swift's on this huge tour and it got this big tear on some level, those shows are just going to run a blur for her. She's not going to remember every specific show and everything that happened at all of them. But as a fan for looking from the outside, that, that was the only time I saw that concert. So of course I remember it very vividly. That connection for me was a big one. And as silly as it sounds, I used to I sort of grind my teeth about some of the silly booking decisions, but Jeff Jarrett said it and it, man, it just brought so much clarity to it. Creative is subjective. And I had never really heard that phrase that way, but it made a lot of sense to me. But several years ago, my daughter was really into wrestling for the first time. And as a dad, who was a wrestling fan, I was all excited about that. When, when Naomi won the belt, they put all those little glow lights around it. So she comes out and starts dancing and you know, her shoes would glow and her outfit would glow, but now the belt glows. And I'm thinking to myself, that's the dumbest shit I've ever seen in my life. Now I'm watching with my daughter. So I don't say that out loud. And she jumps out of her chair. She's so excited. She's like, dad, this is the coolest thing ever. How cool is that belt? And it clicks. It's like, you know what? When I was nine and the million dollar man brought out the million dollar belt, I'm sure my dad looked at that sign, those dollar sign diamonds and thought that is the corniest, stupidest shit I've ever seen. But me being a nine-year-old, like that's the coolest belt ever. That's the million dollar belt. And then it clicked like, Hey, that's just not for me. That segment was for my daughter and she loved it. So the stuff that I watch now that I don't love, I can just say, okay, well, that segment wasn't for me. It's for someone else. I'll find something on this show. I like, and then when I get behind the microphone, I want to talk about that segment that I liked the other stuff, man, maybe my daughter or somebody else's daughter really loved it. It just wasn't for me, but creative being subjective is probably the biggest takeaway. When they don't know it, no, 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 go ahead, John. When they first come out, the sorry, Jerry, when they first come out of the WWE network, I jokingly half jokingly told Vince, Please don't put anything about Bobby the Brain Heenan or Roddy Piper on there, please. Because <laughs> yeah. I didn't want him to see that we're not near as good as those guys were. <laughs> You've reinvented a lot of these older characters. Arn Anderson is one of the most entertaining guys that there is. Jeff Jarrett. I'm, there's not a bigger Jeff Jarrett fan on the planet than, than me. I think, I think right. Jeff is so freaking talented. And Eric Bischoff, well, you know, took WCW, no matter what you th think about him, from losing money to this. Yeah company that was making several hundred million dollars that's one of the greatest corporate stories that there is yes but th they were older guys and i'm saying that because i'm same age or older than a lot of these guys uh you've reinvented these guys and people have been reintroduced to them in a way that you realize these are some really interesting characters that has to be very fulfilling to you to for you to know this and then now the world to come out and say the younger generation to go those guys were really cool you know, I, as a kid, man, I hated Jeff Jarrett. I mean, I even talked about him on Bruce Pritchard's podcast and called him the human fast forward button. I hated him. <laughs> I hated him, but it wasn't until I got to know him. It clicked. It was like, oh yeah, silly. That was his job. He was trying to make you hate him. He did his job really, really well. But once I got to know the guy, Jeff Jarrett, I'm like, man, this guy has forgot more about wrestling than most people will ever know. I loved it. Incredibly smart guy. Yeah. 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 But exactly. Besides Bruce, my favorite story that I've, I guess had a little hand in was Tony Schiavone. I mean, Tony Schiavone was completely out of wrestling, had nothing to do with wrestling whatsoever. Like if a wrestling fan tweeted him, he blocked him. If they called him to his radio show, he hung up on him. He wanted nothing to do with wrestling. And now man, he's like the voice of a whole brand and, and, and a voice of a whole new generation of wrestling fans. One of the most beloved figures in wrestling, but not that long ago, people had decided He's bitter and he hates wrestling, blah, blah, blah. Changing the narrative for him and Bruce, man, that's been the most rewarding part of all this to me. Yeah. Hey, uh, Conrad, coming up, uh, growing up, uh, being a fan and, 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 your, and your, and your next uh, uh, generation, staying a fan, getting close to all these superstars and wrestling and getting inside of our business 
and learning our business from the insiders like Bruce, like JR, like Jeff, and like Arn and 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 uh, and uh, Kurt. Has it changed your perception of the business or has it made you respect it more? Tell us a little bit about that. I respect it a lot more. I mean, I always respected it, but I respect it a lot more now because I can see the real, the real struggle of wrestling is the travel. And I don't think that ever gets talked about enough. Like on some level, I'm sure a lot of guys would want to go wrestle for free. You're paying them for the grueling travel, that unbelievable travel. Uh, but yeah, the actual understanding of why things happen and there's more to it. I mean, I was at an event backstage at a WWE show eight or nine years ago, uh, whenever, uh, blackjack passed away and they had, this is when Bray Wyatt was super, super hot. And all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of commotion and people are running around and I'd become, you know, half ass polite and friendly with Bray. I see him just run by and I'm like, okay, well, that's weird. Uh, and then I find out, man, blackjack is in bad shape. They're going to see their grandfather for the, maybe the last time it's like time. You got to go say your pay your respects and say goodbye and all that jazz. But then I would look online that night and I see people just ripping it apart. Like, boy, they just really dropped the ball with this Bray Wyatt story. Why would they do that? These writers, this creative. And I'm like, the guy's grandpa's like, there's more to life than wrestling. That didn't happen. Like he was written into the show. He was there. It was supposed to happen, but life got in the way. And I think sometimes we, as fans, we just don't have the full story and not that we always should, but it's weird that in this genre, we take such great ownership over it. It's like, but why wasn't it? But it's because it's almost this meat grinder of, well, we got to do 52 weeks of TV every single week. It's not like, I mean, if that would have happened on the Sopranos and James Gandolfini's grandfather was dying, they don't just write him out and do a new episode. They pause it and say, we'll just do it in two weeks. You can't do that. There's people in the arena. The trucks are here. We're going live. And so understanding, Hey man, there's, there's more to it than that. It's not just that idea sucked. And I'm sure that still exists online. I know it does. I just don't participate as often but somebody got hurt. Somebody got sick. Somebody had a family thing. There's real life stuff that we just, as fans, sometimes don't think about. We're just like, well, why wouldn't they do it? Well, his grandpa was sick. He had to leave. That was more important. And just added, having that context and understanding has certainly changed where I'm not as finger waggy maybe as once was. <laughs> do, do you find a fans with the education from the podcast and from our television, from, from guys like me and John ourselves, do you, do you find a fan's attitude has changed or more cynical to our business? Or do you think our, the respect factor of our business is, is a little bit different from your era when you grew up as a fan? I, I think it's a lot different. I mean, I think now there's a lot of armchair quarterbacks. Like I don't even really understand why people talk about ratings. Like, like I think it was almost created by wrestling newsletters because there was a war, right? And we're trying to see who's winning and who's losing. There's not really a war now. It is a totally different world. It is a totally different thing. Like I understand that, you know, ticket sales and ratings used to be the big metric. That's no longer the case. Now it's television rights and all these other licensing deals, but we're still talking about it the way we used to. And it's like, that to me is a little weird. Like we don't handle any other business that way. Like, I don't know any business where we're talking about metrics that used to matter 30 years ago today, as if it's living or dying by it. So I think a lot of times there's armchair quarterbacking, like, like the latest thing in tribalism of wrestling is, man, I can't believe that AEW is doing a third show. It's going to fail, man. It's, it's terrible. That's a bad call. Uh, their ratings suck. Yeah. They suck so bad. The network gave them a third one. What are you talking about? Like th th these guys, it's not like they said, we'd like a show on Saturday. I don't know. I'm not there, but I'm saying the network came to them and said, we want more content. And anybody, any wrestling promotion in the world would be thrilled to have that Saturday slot. But now there's people saying, oh, well, that's a bad night. It's not up to them. What <laughs> night? They're getting paid to do a show. Are you kidding? Like any wrestling promotion would love to have that. And I think sometimes people don't, they think these things happen in a vacuum. Like they sat down with Tony Khan and said, what day and time would you like? That's not the way this normally works. Hey, we have a hole in our programming here. You've done well for us there. Can we get another one? How can that be anything other than a positive? So that sort of thing where it's like, there's a lot of fans who aren't business people who all of a sudden are saying, well, here's what they're doing wrong with their business, buddy. You don't understand business at all. What are you talking about? Just watch the show. And by the way, I never cared what the ratings were for Sopranos. I never cared how much James Gandolfini made on his contract. To make a great comparison. I saw what the number was for succession, which is now one of my all-time favorite shows. 
And that finale had like, I don't know, two, less than 2 million people watch it. And people talk about SmackDown ratings as if they're a failure. It's like, this is the most talked about highly regarded show of the year. And more people watch SmackDown and we're saying that's bad for WWE. Oh, WWE's business is terrible. They had their most profitable year ever. What are you talking about? But, but they'll say, well, look, there's seven empty seats in this photo. You're, you're silly. Is it a bit overblown or is it not? And the reason I asked this is a while back, I was at WWE. One of the guys told me, said, man, Twitter, my Twitter blew up on this. It's something that he had said or something like that. Yeah. So okay, let's go through it and see what, what's blown up on it. So we went through his timeline and it seems very personal because it comes on your phone. I think that's one of the yes. reasons people yes. look at it and, and put a little more gravitas to it than probably they should. But there was probably 25 or 30 references, you know, all, all negative. And yeah. I said, and how many followers do you have? He said, about a million. And I said, okay, now is that representative of 25, 30 people? Or is that representative of a lot more people? You, you don't know that because you don't have that equation that takes that 25 people that speak out to say that means actually 600,000 people, 500,000 people. It might mean actually 25 people. Probably right. doesn't because it probably represents more than that. Sure. But is, is the social media... Is it overblown? Is it a bit of the tail wagging the dog? Or do you think it is what it is as far as the credibility that's given to it by so many? I wish that uh, business people and performers and entertainers would use it as a way to engage with their fans and promote their products and then leave it alone. Like <laughs> even the really successful YouTubers, they don't read the comments. Like the, the real is successful uh, social media influencers, like a Jake Paul, who whether you love him or hate him, you can't deny the dude has made himself important based on social media. His first piece of advice to anybody would be don't read the comments. Like you, you, the views are there. So are the views there? Yeah. Then don't worry about what everybody's saying. They're watching. And that mentality is what I think we need to have. So to your point, a million people are interested in what you're doing, Mr. Professional wrestler, sir, 25 people didn't like it. What is that percentage? Like 10 years ago, when we first started blowing up at my mortgage company, we were doing a ton of advertising. I got a call from the BBB and they said, Conrad, you've had more negative complaints than any other mortgage company in the area. <laughs> and I said, okay, uh, how many did I have? And she said, you've had seven and nobody else has had more than three. And I said, well, ma'am, respectfully, we did $2 billion in loans last year. And the guy who did three did like 20 million. So like percentage wise, I, I I'm 99 point something percent satisfied. So like go read my reviews at conradreviews.com. There's a couple negative ones in there, but overall I've got like 4.72 stars out of five. If any of us are going to dinner in Waterloo, Iowa, and we look at a place and it's got 2000 reviews and it's got 4.72 stars, we're like, shit, I'm going there. I'm not going to focus on, well, this one guy's house didn't appraise for enough. Conrad must suck. What? No, the other, the other 2000 people are thrilled. I'm still going there. I'm still doing that. So yeah, I take it with a grain of salt. Use it to promote your business, use it to engage, but then leave that negativity alone. I don't block anybody, but I mute the shit out of folks. You and I talked about that once. I think you hold the record, John, of the most blocks of anybody I know. John, I John, John, John's blocked more people than the city that he grew up in. <laughs> That's true. I blocked right at 18,000 people. Well, when you showed me years ago in New York, it was like 8,000. I'm proud of you. I'm right at, I'm, I looked about a month or two ago because somebody asked me, it's around 18,000, maybe like 17, eight or 17, nine, but I'm blocked. Congratulations. I just really block sad. anybody's negative. I, I don't want to, I don't want to turn on my phone and have, some, I guess I can mute them. <laughs> <Probably be. laughs> you know, what's funny to me is, is when you have the conversation about, Hey, why did you block me? Why did so-and-so block yeah. me? How about, why do you care? Yeah. Like, right. you know, I'm friendly with Steve Austin. And I guess there was a comment on a podcast me and Bruce did once by somebody else and he blocked me. And so then when I ran into him again, or, you know, whenever he does something cool, I'll text him and say, Hey man, that was great. And I like your new show or whatever. So then one day I run into him and he's like, dude, you, you, you didn't tell me I blocked you. You didn't ask me to unblock you. And I go, no, he goes, why didn't you ask me to unblock you? I'm not an eighth grade girl, Steve. I don't care. Like, you're going to let me block, block me. I don't care. And so he's like, God damn. And, 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 you know, I don't care. Like, well, did, did he unblock him? <laughs> no. And, and I'm not, no. gonna, <laughs> he still hasn't unblocked you. No. And I'm not going to ask. I don't care. Well, come and, on, Steve. Unblock Steve, Conrad. <laughs> Steve, please unblock Conrad. Yeah. 
Well, I, I got one too. I live right down the street from Chris Jericho. Chris Jericho has blocked me, and I see him every every week going up and down my street, not his street, because I've lived out there ten times longer than he has. He waves and honks at me. His wife even waves and honks at me. But Chris has blocked me. On, on the, do I care? I'm talking about it, so I must care. But it doesn't make a difference <laughs> in my life. No, it doesn't. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Like who? Can, I've never cared. Like who follows me or who blocks me or who, what does it matter? I'm using this to promote and, and engage. And if you don't want to see it, you don't want to see, it. I don't care. Like yeah. social I, media I is not real life. Me. folks. Could, could you unblock me? And I said, you blocked me for some reason. And and I always say, well, you must've said something. And, and invariably they get that look. <laughs> you did. <laughs> they're, they're trying to <laughs> think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they don't even remember what they said. <laughs> so Con Conrad, you're, you're, you're the magic man. I mean, you know, there, there, there's these organizations out there and you got to pick a side, but you never pick the side. And I think that's the reason you're so over with the, with the broad base of fan. How did you, how do you get by with working with AEW, with WWE, with impact and all these other organizations? You say, you say the baby face in there. You just, how, how, how's that work? How, how, how tell us. I don't accept the check from anybody. You know, I did yeah. a few things for AW and a few things for WWE. And anytime they send me a tax form and I'm like, no, no, I don't want to be paid. Thank you. Yeah. I don't want to be under a blanket for either one. I'm a wrestling fan. What's good for wrestling yeah. fans is good for me. I never had, uh, uh, I never aspired to work for WWE or AEW or a challenger brand. Not that I'm above it or against it. I'm just yeah. saying I'm always going to do mortgages. This is always going to be the fun hobby thing that helps support mortgages. But yeah, I'm in a unique spot where half the damn AEW roster I do a podcast with, but yeah. I also do one with Bruce. But as long as I'm not necessarily, you know, trying to talk about the other one on the other one show, it's fine. And so we don't talk about current stuff a lot. We talk about nostalgia stuff and I always plug stuff. So on Bruce's show, you're darn right. We're plugging whatever the new right. pay-per-view is money in the bank or whatever. And certainly on JR's and Tony's I'm telling their fans where they can see those guys. Uh, but as long as you're a friend to everyone, you know, you win. And and I like that. I like being Switzerland. Uh, Jeff used to say <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Alps are nice this time of year. Yeah. Yes, they are. Conrad, you've got this incredible following, especially when you aggregate everybody together. You've got a lot of influencers in the wrestling, but it's probably as much as anybody and certainly as, as big a platform as, as anybody that's not one of the major companies yeah. themselves. Um, you've put together some very successful events do you have a long-term plan that is more grandiose? I mean, you're, you are guys very ambitious yes. and you've always had something to look forward to what comes next for you. Do you have that plan? Well, I know you do. Are you going to tell us about it? I can't tell you about it, but yes, I have a plan. You have a plan of something that's much bigger, right? I've signed some paperwork. I have a plan. Good for you. <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> well, is there, is, is, what, what, what advice would you give give aspiring podcasters like jbl and i to become successful in this business what what what, what what's the key to becoming a successful podcaster you know listen man i think uh, i i appreciate you asking that i get that question a lot and i think really you can you can anybody can do a podcast so you got to decide there's sort of a fork in the road which direction do you want to go is this a hobby or is this a business and if this is a hobby, have as much fun and do everything you want to do and do it for you. If it's a business now, you got to stop thinking about you and you got to start thinking about the consumer, the customer, and you got to start thinking, what would, what do they want to hear? And I think the, one of the reasons my shows have been successful is because I'm still a wrestling fan. So a lot of where it's just two wrestlers talking or a wrestler talking, they're talking. I'm a fan. I'm going to ask fan questions. I have a good idea. Like, I know you guys are still fans, but I still think like a fan. I'm going to think like a fan forever. Cause that's all I've ever been. So I know, I tend to think, I know what wrestling fans want to hear and the questions they want to ask and the answers they're looking for. So sometimes I'll find myself arguing with Bruce or Eric about something where I know how they feel and I know what the real thing uh, is, but I've got to be the voice of the fan because the person listening, they haven't been in that car when Bruce told that story. So I don't want to assume that everybody's heard it. So I'm going to say all that to say. Think about what your listener wants, what your consumer wants, and try to super serve that and then promote the shit out of it. But the other thing is, you know, Zig Ziglar used to say, if we waited till all the red lights were green, we'd never go to town. Well, the thing is I got to just start doing stuff. So if you listen to our early stuff and you listen to it now, it's evolved a little bit from my first show with Ric Flair to now, 
and they're a lot different, but I had to learn. I had to start doing stuff. So put yourself out there and really learn. But the hard work is never doing what we're doing now. Just talking. This is the easy, fun stuff. Right. It's the prep. It's the promotion. It's the strategy. So the little things like the graphics and the tweets and the polls and all of that stuff helped, but you had to have a plan and you had to have research. Like every time I sit down and record a podcast, and I mean, every time I've got tens of pages of notes, just because I want to be prepared. I want to be well-versed in what we're talking about. I want to make sure we cover it, cover it thoroughly. And I didn't miss something. And as long as you're doing that and you're putting the prep in, you'll be successful. Now it might take a little longer than you imagine. I think a lot of people assume because I've talked to people before, like, I'm going to quit my job and do this full time. That's not a good idea. I, I, I could have done that. I did not do that. Podcasting was not really a thing 15 years ago. Not something where a lot of people were making money. I don't know that it'll really be a thing 15 years from now. It could continue to evolve. We're doing this with video right now. And a few years ago, nobody was really doing it with video. So I'm just saying it's going to continue to evolve. But so because of that, I don't know how long this will last. I mean, I take a look at like, Look how popular DX was. We talk about that all the time with my buddy Cassio. That shit lasted less than two years. Like when I'm talking about when Road Dog and Billy Gunn were really blowing and going as the New Age Outlaws, it was a finite amount of time and then it was done. And so I'm saying like a lot, of, even Austin's t on top was what, five years? Like start to finish was like five years if you count the walkout and the layout. I mean, when his neck was out and all that. So it's like, man, I'm on borrowed time. Like how long are you in the NFL as a running back? Two years, three years? So I started doing this with Bruce in 2016. I'm on borrowed time. I'm this is supposed to be over anytime. So that's the reason I'm never stopping mortgages. I found a way to dovetail in what I really love and have a passion for with my other thing that I'm actually make money with, which is mortgages. And along the way, it was a happy accident. I made money doing this too. So that would be my advice. Find whatever your passion is and try to find a way to marry it to your current real life job or business. And I would encourage you on your own show push the thing you own. I love our sponsors like Blue Chew and, and all the others. However, I don't own any of those, but when you go to savewithconrad.com, I do really well on that. So I'm going to promote it forever and ever. So my, my fun thing supports my real thing. If that makes sense, that's my, my key to my success. Where do you see the evolution of podcasting going? I, I think it's going to be more short form video stuff. You know, I think, uh, and I know YouTube isn't really monetizing shorts now they will, but you know, TikTok and, and, and the short form video stuff. I've said for a while that it was going to be video that's already happening. Like you, you take a look and you see just people using television, just going down, 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 down every year. I have, I had direct TV for over 25 years and I cut the cord last year. I've got YouTube TV and sling TV. Now I only keep sling for a and E and vice, but I, I I've got both now and it's just way better, but I still find myself watching YouTube more than anything else. And the YouTube shorts are taken over. Like you take a look at uh, some of the channels, it, like John Cena was recently on Sam Roberts show and they did a phenomenal job. Go out of your way to see it. It's a great interview. But if you take a look at the number of people who watched it, who uh, versus the amount who watched the shorts, it's like 10 to one on the shorts. I don't know why we consume it that way. I just think long form podcasting will always be here. It'll always have a place but I think shorts are where the real money is going to go. I don't know why we work that way, but we just do. When you talk about shorts, what, what length are you talking about? So I'm saying like, think about like a TikTok video, like a minute, two minutes, three minutes, that might even be too long, but even like 60 second videos, like 10 second videos. One of my favorite YouTube channels is a thing called daily dose of internet. That cat makes a boatload of cash. And all he does is go license other people's videos and then put the best of them in one. And man, just tens of millions of people watch it. And it's just little bitty clips of, you know, an eagle catching a fish. And now we're going to see the way this electricity works on this girl's hair. And now we're going to see a dog trying to bite a water, uh, water coming out of a water hose. It's silly. It's fast. It's all over the place. And I think the content like you guys are creating right now, it has value as it is right now. And it will continue to be a little money funnel for you guys forever and ever. But you can repurpose what you're doing right now a million different ways because you can put it on all the different platforms. TikTok wasn't a thing that long ago. And, you know, Instagram wasn't a thing that long ago. And there will be more that pop up. I mean, Snapchat's monetizing now, but there will be more evolution of that social media stuff forever and ever. But just repurposing some of the old clips, and instead of it being a, a 60 or 90 minute interview, now it's a two minute clip. 
man, that thing's going to print money forever and ever. So content creation is key, but just, you know, understand you kind of, kind of be like water. You got to go with the flow here. And as that stuff changes, you'll evolve and Hey, here's a new platform. Let's cut it up and repurpose it. It's like always, you know, the distribution model changes significantly from over time, but content is always king. Yes. And, and to your point, think about those old territory tapes and how nobody thought there was any value in them. Hell, back in the day, y'all used to record over the shows just to save right. money on the tape with no real understanding of what this could be someday. Oh, they lost. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm sorry to cut you off. They lost about 10 years of Johnny Carson. Yes. I mean, John, that's, that's, that's so freaking valuable. And think about like what the Crockett tapes sold for in that part of that WCW sale peanuts in the scheme of things, but even people were saying, yeah, but how would he ever make money with that? Well, look at what they license the network to Peacock for. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. And they're going to get it over and over and over. It's a license deal. They're not selling it. So I'm just saying the, this content that you guys are creating that we're all creating on these podcasts, we'll be able to cut them up and, and play it over and over and over. And listen, this sounds weird. And I don't mean for this to sound the way it does, but outside of WWE, like think about what a national treasure Jim Ross has been. He is the voice of wrestling for generations of fans outside of WWE grilling JR, or I'm sorry, those cheeks, LLC, it owns more Jim Ross content than anybody, but WWE. And, and we will be able to reimagine those stories and take his voice and, and do animations to it. I don't know if you guys have seen like tales from the tour bus before. But what a great show that is. And you're never really actually talking to the star of the band. You're talking to the people around the band and they're telling stories and they animated it. The guy who did King of the Hill, Mike Judge, he animated it. It was on Cinemax or Showtime. My favorite show. Absolutely loved it. We could do that with these wrestling stories. These stories will live on forever and ever. So think, just keep that in mind as you're creating content. This will have value forever. You might not see it right now. But nobody thought way back when these territory tapes are going to be worth a whole bunch of cash one day either. Conrad, you mentioned that you're on borrow time. Uh, you, like I see 2016, you started. And yeah. there's, a fin there's a finite time where you're on top of the mountain. Except unless you're, say, The Undertaker or Shawn yes. Michaels, who reinvents yeah. himself, or Paul Heyman. Or yes. a, lot, a lot of guys did. You know, Paul Heyman, you could say the same thing maybe back in the early 90s. Well, he's on borrow time the ECW. He's just as hot now or hotter than he was 20 years ago. Yes. So if you constantly reinvent yourself, you're able to extend that time. I know you've thought about that. What, how, how are you reinventing yourself, say with Bruce or with Jr. or with your podcast formats themselves? So you don't have that finite time. Well, I'm glad you asked. 2016 was Bruce. 2017, we added Shivani. 2018, we added Eric. 2019, we added Jr. Along the way, we started doing StarCast. Eventually, we started adfreeshows.com. Last year, even though everybody on this call didn't like it, I ran Ric Flair's last match. Like, I just <laughs> try things. I just keep trying things. And that's it. Some of them will work. Some of them won't. <laughs> but yeah, listen, I, I just I, I just keep trying things. And some of it will work. Some of it won't. So what? Uh, but but I, I, I feel like I have my finger on the pulse of what I would buy. So I always say, Hey man, could I sell this to me? Would I get excited about that? And if the answer is no, I don't do it. But if I think I could get excited about it and I would, I would pull out money and pay for it, then, then I'll do it. So that's what I've been trying to do from the beginning, man. I really, I don't know exactly what the next thing is, but I have some fun ideas. So speaking of Bruce, cause uh, we all love our friend Bruce and I'm not saying that facetiously. We all do love Bruce. Yes. We, love, yes. we love giving him a hard time too. We love Bruce. <laughs> Bruce has such a great was there for so much and he's such a great storyteller what has surprised you as far as stories that resonated with the fans that you thought maybe wouldn't and what has surprised you that didn't resonate with the fans out of different events that Bruce has talked about from the backstage uh, segment you know the thing that surprises me that there's a bigger passion for is that new generation era when the WWF was down so like I knew all the golden age stuff and the attitude era stuff would pop, but that sort of dead space in between where the business just wasn't as hot. So call it 93, 94, 95, that stuff where I wasn't even watching. I just didn't think there would be that big of an appetite for, and then there was, and I think I sort of took that for granted because I think there's a nostalgia. And so like when people who, who don't know that, that my, my thing in podcasting is wrestling, 
sometimes people that I meet in real life, they'll say, Hey, I heard you're a podcaster. What are your podcasts about? And I say nostalgia, because I think that's really what it is. Like, I can't tell you how many times Bruce and I did a live show and people would come out to see a live podcast. Think about how that is like, so we're just going to watch two guys sit on the stage and tell stories. Yes. And they do. But the reason they did is because they were lapsed fans and, and they don't even watch anymore, but this makes them feel like they did back then. And I think that nostalgia exists for all of us, certainly with music and with movies. Like if casino is on tonight, I don't care what's it, what else is on TV. If it's on, I'm just going to watch it. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. I don't have to start it at the beginning. I'll just pick up where I'm at. I'm just, I love that movie, but there's songs that are that same. Like if it's in that handful of years and my friend, Brian Rogers in South Carolina says, in his opinion, everybody's got 10 years. They have 10 years worth of music. That's their favorite. They have 10 years worth of movies. That's their favorite. They have 10 years worth of sports. That's their favorite. Like nineties NBA. I could talk about that all day long. The current stuff. I might could, I'd pass a test on it. I wouldn't get an A, but man, if you had a question about, you know, what was the magic doing in 1992 when Shaq came on, I know every player, I know what the record was. I mean, like all that silliness that's there for me. And I think that's there for wrestling too. So I think there's a whole generation of fans that that era that wasn't a hit for me, man, that's in their 10 year wheelhouse and they just can't get enough of it. Yeah, yeah, Con Con Conrad, you, you said you'd be watching that movie tonight, but if Alabama was playing Georgia, what would you be watching? Oh, Alabama, Georgia all day. <laughs> Alabama, Georgia, you, you know, all day. Me and uh, me and Jerry did one of Bruce's live shows. He was sold out. Bruce made a lot of money. We we didn't we didn't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> and but we got invited back to another show that we also did, and yeah. we didn't get paid for it. Yeah, we didn't get paid. <laughs> you're on the you're on the Bruce Pritchard program. I've been on that one before. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say Bruce, did you make a lot of money? He goes, Oh, we made a fortune. I go, <laughs> me and Mr. Briscoe didn't get a check. He goes, No, 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 you you guys don't get paid. He goes, But I made a lot of money. I love that. I love that. And that's the real promoter in him right there. Yeah. <laughs> He's Con the Conrad best. sitting here watching you and I'm, I'm looking back and my eyes keep darting back to your, your trophy case back there. Out of all, all your, how many, how many belts do you have for how many championship belts do you have? To begin I think with? I have about 15. What is your favorite one of all time? The one what's right your oldest head. also. Uh, the big gold belt is my favorite right there. Uh, that's the actual one from 1986. And then that right there is the uh, WrestleMania 17 Big Eagle. So that's the Austin Rock World Title. Right. And right below that, that is the Macho Man's Intercontinental. So those are probably my favorite three right there. Wow. Great. And that, on, on the other end over there, that's uh, Vader and Ron Simmons World Title. Yeah. The WWE wow. Belt. Wow. That's cool. I've got the old uh, NWA US, the 10 pounds of silver, like Roddy Piper held and all that. So that's a wow. cool one, too. And we're speaking of football. When, when did you uh, first become, uh, I guess all your life, you've been an Alabama fan, Crimson Tide fan, but you, you're now really involved in it. Do you do anything with the team down there at all nowadays? No, no. I just, I've had the same season tickets for 20 years. Uh, zone section seven, uh, row two, seat 20 and 21. My dad have had them since they opened that up. Before that, we were GG, 31 rows up. Um so yeah, we've just gone to the games as much as we could. My dad hasn't, he's only been to one game since the pandemic. Uh, and it was kind of our thing. So I try to watch all the games with him. And every year I say, Hey dad, uh, so-and-so is playing against Alabama this week. You want to go? Ah. So, I, I mean, I've only been to one since 2020, uh, but it's still sort of mine and his thing, but in Alabama, man, football's a religion down here. Right. It's like, what's your name? Where are you from? Who do you pull for? And you have basically two options, Alabama or Auburn. We're in North Alabama, so occasionally you'll get a weirdo who will say Tennessee. But like around here, if you're like Marshall, I mean, you'll just get your ass kicked saying some shit like that. You gotta <laughs> pick a side. Alabama or Auburn, that's it. And so I was an Alabama fan because my dad was an Alabama fan. And he was an Alabama fan because his dad was an Alabama fan. So it's just passed down. And I'm thrilled that although I never went, Morgan does. And uh, as my wife says, T Town be getting them dollars. That is not a cheap right. school, but she's having fun. Who, who's your all-time Bama coach, favorite coach? Oh, I mean, how could you not pick Saban? Now, my dad would say Bear Bryant. Of course, Bear. I got a bronze thing of the bear downstairs. But, I mean, Saban has done stuff that's just unbelievable. I think all time, it's probably Belichick and Saban as the two greatest football coaches of all time. And it's crazy to know they used to be on the same squad back in the day with the Browns. Like, how did, yeah, how did the Browns happen? lose those two? 
should have won every game. Are you yeah. kidding? Me? It's like when you had Hallis and Landry on the same t- uh, coaching staff, you know, Unbelievable. What, what are you doing? Unbelievable. Um, among my brother's prized possessions was a recruitment letter from Bear Bryant, by the way. He had a Bob Devaney, he had Bud Wilkinson. Of course, he signed with Bud Wilkinson, and I met Bud when he came to our home to recruit my brother. But my brother's prized possession was, was the Bear Bryant recruitment letter. Man, that's so cool. I would have loved to have seen that. My uh, There was an auction going a year or two ago, and they had they found an old Cadillac that had been abandoned, but in the glove box, uh, was the original title paperwork and it was a Cadillac sold to bear Bryant. And in the trunk wow. was one of his old hats, one of the old oh, hats yeah, hat still I'll in see. the trunk. So they auctioned both off and I was hanging in there tough for that hat. And then it got to like 37,000. And I was like, well, I love you, dad, but <laughs> is a lot of money for a hat. So yeah. I didn't, we were it. in Alabama one time, Conrad, and I was out there cutting a promo for the crowd. And Ron, Ron was standing back by some police officers in the back. One of the police officers going, you know, your, your buddy out there, he's really good. He really, he's riles up the crowd. Good. He's, he's really good. And then, then I said something about bear Bryant. And he said, the cop's face just changed completely. He goes, you know, he ought to shut his mouth about right now. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's it. That's it, man. That's them's fighting words. Even now, like I would be willing to bet. And I'm not slamming Alabama when I say this, cause I've, I've only ever lived here. This is home forever. Amen. But, uh, nobody, I mean, more people know who Nick Saban is in this state, even our governor. Like seriously, yeah. if you just stop yeah. people on the street, uh, you know, ne- check the boxes of all the names, you know, Saban number one, and then eventually maybe we get to K I V, but probably not. It's just amazing. You know, the national championship a couple of years ago was, was an sec conference game. Yeah. yeah. It has been a few times. It's yeah. nuts. It's just a different level. That's why I'm a little worried about, uh, I'm sure it gives me a hard <laughs> time about my longhorns going into SEC. I'm excited. You got to come to a game, man. I think we're both going to be trading back and forth with, uh, with Texas and, and Alabama. We should do that. That'll be fun. It would be fun. Yeah. yeah. It may take Texas. A while. They, got, they got so much money there. You know, the, they'll, they'll, I think they'll figure it out, but it, I think there's going to be a curve there that they're not quite prepared for. Well, I, I here's what I know. It's two big programs and it'll be two great fan bases. So it the will be that. thing and the that. partying will be a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, it will. <laughs> Hey, before we go, I got to ask you one the the most important question there is, is Dave Silva not the greatest person on the planet? He is definitely top five. Uh, top uh, five? Uh, yeah, wow. well, here's the thing. You know, Dave has wrecked my car before. Oh. No. Uh, yeah, so he, uh, he he wanted to go to breakfast, and he asked if he could borrow my car, and I said yes. <laughs> so he went to the Chick-fil-A drive through as I understand it, huh? and he somehow managed to curb all four wheels in the same drive through and that's a feat not I've never even seen right. a life do. Like, how do you do all four? And normally it's like a little bit. He got one that was three quarters of the way. And I'm like, Dave, when you hit it, did you just think let's just power through? And he goes, kinda. And I'm like, okay, well, there it is. <laughs> and so then recently, and here's some breaking news. His wife was in a fender bender. She's fine. So are the kids. Everybody's fine. And so he's like trying to figure out the rental car thing. And I go, dude, I got an extra car. Just take the X five. It's the same car he wrecked now. Just take this. And he goes, okay. They told me mine will be ready by next Friday. That was four weeks ago. I still <laughs> have the damn car back. So yes, he's been demoted from number one, all-time greatest <laughs> to just top five cars and him cars and the Silva's just soil and water. It's not good. I guess I should open up a, a, an annex up at a, a Briscoe brothers body shop up in Huntsville, huh? Buddy, <laughs> just, just, just for the Silva's he'd keep just the, for the Silvas. Paper, just for the Silva's. <laughs> Taker had agreed to sell one of his bikes and uh, he got some big, you know, deal for it. He's gonna make a big deal about signing and all that stuff. So, and Midian was out staying with him and took it on one little last ride yeah. <laughs> and laid the bike over and wrecked it. Oh my God. <laughs> Taker said Midian came back and Midian said the same thing. He came back and goes, I'm sorry, I'll just leave. <laughs> did he, did he? Yeah. That's tremendous. Well, that, that's, the, that's the way Dave tried to soft shoot with me. He goes, I might have accidentally kind of sort of maybe uh, scratched a wheel. And it's like, no, no, you curbed all four. Now it was fine. Nobody was hurt. He got his damn chicken biscuit. I guess it's all. <laughs> well, Conrad, we can't thank you enough for coming on. We've well, been trying to get you for a while because uh, you're such an important guy. We wanted to have you on our podcast. I and mean, we think it's well deserved that uh, you're in the going in the Hall of Fame. I mean, you're on our podcast that we have with Stan Hansen and all the other great legends of the wrestling. And you're one of you become one of them as well. 
I don't know about that. I can't believe I'm going to get to do this though. I'm so glad we get to do it together. And I hope I remember most of it the next day, but Mr. Briscoe, would it be possible for you to stretch my dad? Do you think he could do that? <laughs> Uh, how old's your dad? <laughs> he's younger than you. He can take. Well, it. Hey, hey, he's too young then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I only, 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 only. I'm gonna be like the Ver Gagne days. I'm only gonna do guys that older than me. You know. <laughs> I got you. I got you. About four, Conrad. About four beers in, he'll Ask start looking. Again? He'll start looking for your dad. I love it. I'll give you that <laughs> sideways look, right, John? Yeah. That's right. When he starts coming a little bit, he, when he starts walking at you almost a little bit crooked, you're like, run. Whatever you do, run. <laughs> Set off the fire alarm. Call 911. Most importantly, run. Because there's it. no talking them out of it. I would hear Bruce and JBL out in the hallway, and I'd after we'd been to the bar, I'd say, yeah, you guys are too loud. I'd come out, and I'd start walking. I guess I'd walk sideways when I'm a little, little wasted, and, and <laughs> both of them would scatter because they didn't want any part of it. <laughs> we know you, he knows he's coming after us. Now I know. Like, if he's sideways. Hotel, they got the wrestling gear on, the headgear on, and they're walking through the lobby, both of them, Jerry sideways, and Bruce just happy-go-lucky and looking for Kurt Angle. That's not a good idea. That no, was it wasn't idea. a good idea. No. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm glad Kurt didn't know that because he ran. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kurt's he a kind worked. person. Yeah, he's a kind. He didn't want to hurt yes, me. Thank, thank goodness the best wrestler on the planet is a kind yeah. person. Yeah. Yes. It could have been a lot worse for a lot of people if Kurt wasn't such a nice person. Well, Conrad, we, we're really looking forward to July 22nd through 24th, I believe it, up, up in Waterloo. I have to, uh, Dan Gable Museum. Have you ever met Dan Gable? I have not. No, sir. You know, what, what a great guy he is, right, John? I mean, he's, Absolutely. A, he, he's so respectful of our business, and he's a, he's a great welcome. Hey, and host, Jerry, host, I mean, cut you off, but he's, he's kind of one of those guys like uh, like your brother or, or Fez. When he, when he walks around, you realize that's a badass. Yeah, you may yeah. not know what he does, but you realize that's somebody you know, important. You know. I love it. I can't well, wait we, to meet him. We're looking forward to seeing you up there, and congratulations on it. Uh, we're all waiting to waiting to, to hand you that award. It's going to be a wonderful night. Thank you very much for uh, being a participant in it. Hey, man, thank you so much. I'm just honored and uh, humbled to even have the opportunity. And look at this, man. I got to come on you guys' show. Thanks for having me.